Thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Mike Martin once again, and I'm so happy that you've taken the time out of this busy day to join us. There's a lot of things going on out here. First of all, we're going to talk about the monarch butterfly a little bit, a little bit about the pollinators, the native pollinators you can grow in your yards. But I'm really excited to share with you today our new outdoor monarch life cycle kit. Again, it's an outdoor monarch life cycle kit. Can you imagine that? A lot of people have been talking about that and wondering things that they can do. So now with this, you will have the opportunity to purchase this from us and share in the fun and the joy of raising monarch butterflies. First of all, before we get going anymore, I want to take a second and uh, share with you the power and the influence of one monarch butterfly caterpillar. A few years ago, Cam Watts and was having a conversation with Clark and Mary McLeod. During that time, share, uh, Cam shared the concerns of the monarch with Cam and Mary. And so Cam asked, or excuse me, Clark asked Cam, <laughs> what things can we do to help make a difference? And so Cam shared with Clark this one monarch caterpillar. Clark and Mary raised that caterpillar. They fed it milkweed and they fed it milkweed, and they fed it milkweed. They figured out that this caterpillar is going to eat a lot of milkweed, especially as a third, fourth, and fifth in star. Later on during that time, that monarch crawled to the top of the enclosure, and it formed this pupa. A few days later, it turned black, and it kind of concerned Mary and Clark that, what did we do wrong? And then all of a sudden, that monarch eclosed, it came out, the legs came out, the abdomen came out, the wings came out, and before you know it, here's a beautiful monarch butterfly. And that's all it took to influence Clark and Mary to begin raising monarch butterflies. So they called Cam up and said, Cam, what can we do to help make a difference? Well, they talked about increasing the number of monarch butterflies, maybe increase the amount of pollinator habitat we have, and also find a way to rear monarch butterflies. So all in all, as things went along, Clark got involved with the city of Cedar Rapids and Marion and began to plant a thousand acres of habitat around the city. They got with the secondary roads in Lynn County and began to plant 2,000 miles of habitat on both sides of the secondary roads in Lynn County. And then they decided we've got to do some rearing of monarchs Let's create the six by six bio enclosure. And now what do we have here? We have the outdoor monarch life cycle kit. Unbelievable, such a great opportunity. So again, just like everything else, you now know the rest of the story. A Couple of other things we need to talk about are these webinars. These webinars are being recorded. The Webinars can be found, again, like I said, monarchresearch.org and under the events section. Next Saturday, June 20th, you want to be right here, where we're going to have Cam Watts give his discussion, his talk, his webinar on advanced monarch rearing, utilizing the biotents. So again, you want to be here for that. Now, one of the things I'd like to do is send you on a trip, courtesy of Brian Smith, from Great Big Nature, featuring the adventurous Brian Keating, who will be your guide. When you return from this trip, I will meet you at the gate. So get your passports out, sit back and relax. I'll see you soon. We're in Mexico searching for what some might consider a tourist, a migratory species more familiar to the US or Canada, but it's here that the monarch butterfly spends its winter. Most monarch butterflies have a short life, living a few weeks at best. The monarchs in this forest were born in Canada or the northeastern states.
And like their parents and grandparents, they spend the first few weeks of their lives feeding and sticking close to home. Then one day in autumn, no one knows exactly what triggers or guides them. They take off on an incredible journey, flying more than 3,000 kilometers to a completely different world. This is an astounding experience. I have butterflies all around me. I can hear the gentle flapping of their wings continuously. Monarch butterflies may be the ultimate creatures of habit. Every winter they flock by the millions to the same forests in Mexico. Using an internal GPS that still baffles scientists, it will fly up to 8,000 kilometers across strange territory to a home it has never seen. Every year, a new generation of monarchs flies to this specific region of Mexico. It's a tiny part of the world, about 60 square miles. So tiny, the locals managed to hide it from outsiders until 1975. Now there are 11 designated sanctuaries within this area, protecting millions and millions of butterflies. There's thousands of them crowding every one of these trees. The branches of these fir trees are actually bending under the weight of the butterflies. They are all over the ground, throughout the air. It's as if we were in a cloud of butterflies. The energy expended by a monarch to reach this sanctuary is phenomenal. Remember, this is a creature that weighs less than a paper clip, and it flies about 80 kilometers a day to get here. Pound for pound, it's the equivalent of a human walking around the world 11 times. We're about 3,000 meters above sea level. Temperature's constant here. It's perfect for the butterflies to overwinter. It chills down at night, allowing them to save on their metabolic energy. And then during the daytime, it warms up like this, especially at this time of the year, and they go off and find nectar and moisture. They cling to the pines for five months, huddling together for warmth. In another month, they'll start migrating north. When temperatures rise, they ride the warm spring breezes to Texas and stop to mate, and the cycle starts once again. It will take three generations of monarchs, living one month each, to make their way north again. That a tiny caterpillar morphs into a beautiful butterfly is a miracle in itself. But the mystery of the fourth generation migrating to Mexico boggles the mind. There's nothing like it in the natural world. An experience of a lifetime. The first time I watched this video, I just says, wow, that is, uh, that is amazing. It's something I had never seen. It shows the butterflies down in the overwintering habitats down there in Mexico. And I know I put that on my bucket list. We have a friend of ours down there in Macheros, down near Sierra Pallon. Uh, it's Ellen Sharp. She has J&M Butterfly b, b And I keep telling Ellen, I'm going to come down there. So again, as you just heard, it's on my bucket list. And Ellen, if you're listening, I am coming down someday. So let's continue on about the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly has been around for, they're saying anywhere from 175 to 250 million years. That's quite a long time. I had no idea until about five years ago that the monarch butterfly can be found all around the world. In the North America, South America, New Zealand, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. While I was giving a talk one day, a young lady came up and said, Mike, my husband and I took a trip down to Australia. And they also took a putter jumper over to New Zealand. During that time, they said all kinds of butterflies, including the monarch. Her question to me was, Mike, how does that small monarch butterfly get from Australia 
all the way over to Mexico to overwinter. And then in the spring, how does it return clear back here to Australia? That's crazy. So I kind of paused for a second and told her that this actually is a non-migratory monarch. There are areas of the world that the monarch does not migrate. Here in the United States, we could probably say that we have two groups that do not migrate to Mexico. The first group is located in California, west of the Rockies. That group is considered the Western population of the monarch butterfly. It does migrate down to the Southern part of California, and that's where it overwinters. Down in Florida, around the central part of Florida to the southern part of Florida, there is basically a permanent generation of monarchs, a group that stays down there permanently. Now, there may be a few monarchs that get up and come across, maybe across the Gulf, but for the most part, they are right there. What we're going to talk about today is the eastern population of the monarch butterfly. This is the group that migrates from Mexico up through Texas to the lower states, up through the Midwest part of the United States, and all the way up to Canada. Again, that last generation, the migrating generation, then turns around and comes back. The crazy part about that is, is that monarch has never been here, nor has its parent, its grandparent, its great-grandparent, possibly its great-great-great-grandparent. So anyway, you can see that this monarch has no idea how to get there by some way, by some instinct, it has its radar set and it finds its way down to the Mexico. Looking at this map here, what jumps out at you? Take a look. The Midwest. 38% of the monarchs that overwintered down in Mexico come from the Midwest. 38%. Now, why would you think that would be so high? What things could be different about the Midwest? Right. We have some of the best farm ground in the world. We can raise corn. We can raise beans, oats, sorghum, wheat, straw, hay. We, we can raise it all. We can do it. We're producing enough here to feed the world. So why can't we feed the pollinators. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but the big thing here is we can do so much to benefit both the monarch butterfly and the pollinators, and we'll address that here in a second. Here in Iowa, we're looking at native milkweed. There is basically 17 different varieties of milkweed that grow in the United in Iowa. We know that we need milkweed to feed the monarch caterpillar. So here in Iowa, when we raise monarchs, we raise the monarchs on swamp milkweed and common milkweed. Butterfly weed is something that we can use also, but it, a lot of times it's more used more likely in native uh, plantings. Uh, it's also used in landscaping around your home. So when we design a seed mix, it's called the Monarch Research Seed Mix. We include these three milkweed plants, the seeds of those plants. That's something that I believe on the second webinar, Jim shared with people that when we want people to plant pollinator habitat in their yards, these seeds, or the, these milkweed seeds will be in that seed mix. Again, we're talking about the migration. When the monarchs migrate from Mexico all the way up to Canada, how are they going to get there? How are they going to survive? It's kind of like if, uh, say, Ellen down there in Macheros wants to drive all the way up to Canada to see uh, Carol. She needs to fuel up her car. She's going to need to stop at gas stations all the way up through Texas, through the Midwest, all the way up to Canada she's going to need to stop and fuel up her car. Same thing is true with these, mo these monarchs as they migrate from Mexico, they get up to Texas, they're going to need to stop and refuel. They need pollinator plants, they need milkweed to lay their eggs. So both milkweed and those pollinator plants, specifically native plants to that particular part of the country. As they migrate north into the Midwest, 
you're looking at a couple of generations that they need again spring and summer blooming flowers. That nectar, that fuel to provide them the energy that they need to continue their flights. They also need that energy provided by the nectar plants for breeding purposes. As that my monarch, again, through different generations, continues north up to Canada, it's going to need those pollinator plants up there also. You're getting up into, into the, uh, whether it be up in Canada, if it's in the Midwest, in the fall, yes, they're going to need the milkweed plants, but more so the nectar plants. In the fall, that generation changes. That monarch goes into reproductive diapause, and it's going to turn around and begin to head south, both from Canada and from the Midwest. Their dependence upon milkweed isn't as strong as it is on nectar plants. So as that monarch begins to head south, it needs those fueling stations to stop at and to continue all the way down to Mexico. So again, when we talk about the native nectar plants, that's exactly what we're looking for. Monarch butterfly life cycle. The monarch butterfly life cycle is amazing. It's amazing life cycle from the standpoint of you've got, you go from egg all the way to monarch butterfly in 30 to 34 days. When a, monarch, a female monarch lays her eggs on a milkweed, in most cases, she may only lay one egg per plant because she knows that her babies are going to eat that plant. She wants to make sure that there's plenty of leaf structure, there's plenty of food on that plant for that caterpillar to eat. As it grows, it's going to grow and it's going to shed its skin. With the larva, the caterpillar, it's going to basically shed its skin four times until the fifth generation. Every two to three days, it's going to shed its skin. So it's going to eat and shed its skin every two to three days. From first instar all the way up to fourth, then as a fifth instar, it's going to crawl up to a higher point. It's going to find a point on the leaf or on another structure nearby and create its chrysalis. It's going to spin a small silk button and become a pupa, better known as the chrysalis. In about 10 to 14 days, that chrysalis is going to turn translucent. And you'll see the black, the orange, and the white of the monarch butterfly. Before you know it, it's going to split and the legs will come out and grab the outside of that chrysalis and it'll drop the abdomen down and that'll be a thick, plump abdomen as well as the wings will come out. The wings will be crinkled, they'll be wet, they'll be very small. The butterfly will come out and it'll swing back and forth. As it's doing that, it's pumping up its wings. From there, it's going to climb up and allow, the t allow those wings to dry out. For us, for our rearing purposes, we will leave those monarchs in our rearing enclosures for about 24 hours. We also look at the weather to make sure that it's conducive to release the, butter the butterflies. If not, if after 24 hours, it's the weather outside isn't good enough, or we feel it's not good enough to release the monarch, we will then lightly mist our enclosure to give the moisture, the water that that monarch needs. It doesn't necessarily need the nectar right away, but it needs hydration. Again, four to six days as an egg, 10 to 14 days as larva, as a, as a uh, caterpillar. As a pupa or chrysalis, again, another 10 to 14 days, then it becomes a monarch butterfly. It, it's incredible. And once you experience that transformation, you're hooked, you're all in. I know when I raised my first monarch, I was working another job and I found a caterpillar out in the property. I brought it in, put it under a cup and I was feeding it leaves throughout its time. As that monarch would eat the leaves, I had to get more leaves. And during that time, of course, everybody knows when monarchs, caterpillars eat the, uh, the milkweed leaves, they poop. A better word for that is 
frass. People, frass is going to happen. So again, as you're raising your monarch, you're cleaning your enclosure, it's very important to keep it clean. That monarch is going to grow, that caterpillar is going to climb to the top of the enclosure, create that chrysalis. I experienced all of that. When that happened in my office, I had a meeting that day, it was black, it was translucent. I didn't want to leave and go to my meeting, but I had to. Did I take that with me or should I leave it in my desk? So I left it right there at my desk. After that meeting, I ran back to my office and lo and behold, there's my monarch butterfly. Again, people, the excitement you have when you have your first e-closure, you have your first butterfly. For me, I wanted to hand out cigars to all of my employees. I was a proud papa and you will experience this. The feeling that I had was, was unbelievable. But then when I released it, it was amazing to see my butterfly fly off. I was hooked, I was hooked. Now to tell the difference between a male and female monarch butterfly, what do you do? I was at a meeting and over at Indian Creek Nature Center for the Monarch Fest. And we had a group of people standing around where we had the monarchs. And I asked the group by a show of hands, who knows the difference between a male and female monarch? I looked around and every kid, every child in the group had their hands raised. The adults were like down here. They weren't really sure. So I asked one of the little girls, I said, uh, what can you tell me, which one is the male and which one's the female? Right away she says, it's the one with the two black spots on the bottom wings. Fantastic. But then she carried on and said, the females have dark, darker lines. They're more boldly. So she meant the veins were a lot darker and more boldly. And plus the colors of the monarch were a little bit deeper. So again, to understand the difference between a male and female, your best way to identify it is ask a child. They will tell you. Now, getting into, once again, I seriously am excited about sharing this with everyone, the Outdoor Monarch Life Cycle Kit. Now, how this came about was a lot of times we have people visit our research station. They know they want to raise monarch butterflies. They get out there, they look at what we have. We have a great six by six monarch bio tent as well as a nine by nine. We give you full instructions on how to plan it and how to raise monarchs in each of those. But a lot of people shared with us, they didn't think they had the space to do it. So over the last year, we located a great enclosure and now we have the opportunity to share this with you to allow you to experience the excitement of raising monarch butterflies. You can do this on a patio, a porch, a deck, or a balcony. Something else, you can bring in containers of pollinators, containers of plants that you can raise and grow. And if you do a really good job, you put some milkweed in there, you're gonna attract the butterflies and the other pollinators to your site, to where you have those plants. What's included in our life cycle kit is again, that heavy duty 15 by 15, 30 inch tall outdoor life cycle enclosure. And this enclosure people is heavy duty. It's very well built. It's sturdy as heck. And again, it is a pop-up. We're going to include the 10 inch saucer to keep that milkweed moist a container of healthy, growing, live milkweed. No more worrying about cuttings. Two to four caterpillars, which we will determine with you when you pick it up, as far as how many caterpillars, according to the amount of food we have available. We're going to also include a small paintbrush and a spoon, which will help you transfer the caterpillar if it falls back on to the milkweed plant. One thing I want to address there is if those caterpillars fall, please do not reach in and grab the caterpillar and use your hands to bring it up. There are so many things that can be on your hands that can stress out the caterpillar and can also transfer disease to that caterpillar. 
use the spoon and use the brush and then put it back on the leaf. Also, right here we have Carol Pashenik's book, How to Raise Moderate Butterflies. And if you look below that, it says a step-by-step -step guide for kids. Now, talking to Carol often, I talked to her last night, I always say for kids of all ages, I'm a kid too. I enjoy what I do and I seriously enjoy butterflies. Every time I see a clothes in the enclosure, I watch the enclosure. It's amazing. The price on this right now is at around $40. So you, you can't go wrong with this. Now to a couple of other things that you may want to pick up. We highly recommend to keep that enclosure in place in case you get some winds. The wind will go through it as well the light and the moisture. The enclosure will break up the moisture that comes through, but we want to keep it where it's at. We used a brick, real simple. Some people may have a small sandbag they could put back there. Also, you want to get a lot of life out of this enclosure, so you want to have some kind of a thing like maybe a doormat or a um, tile like this. I, have a, I bought a 15 by 15 inch by about an inch thick tile at one of the local box stores and it works great. So again, these two items will definitely help you out. Once you have all these items assembled, you wanna put be, begin to put it together. But one caution, I think a lot of people know this, is that the milkweed sap can be a concern on your skin as well as your eyes. Anytime you handle the milkweed, please, wash your hands or use gloves. Extra protection will take care of you and take care of the monarch butterflies. So let's go ahead and put it together. When you get in your enclosure, you're definitely gonna to wanna to wash it, make sure it's clean, let it dry. Take it to your site, get your protectant down below, like either that tile or maybe a doormat, put that down on, on your surface, put your, your enclosure on that, and then make sure that that door is accessible where when you're gonna be working on this, you want full access. So have that door where it's most appropriate. Next, you're going to bring that weight, that brick or whichever you choose to use and put that closest to the door. Next item, you're gonna take that 10 inch saucer, put it in front of that item, closest to the front part of the enclosure. Next, you're going to add the plant. Now, before you add this plant, what I want you to do is water that plant heavy, not in the saucer, but water that plant heavy, let it get wet. And then when you put it on the saucer, add a little bit of water. On that plant also will be those two to four caterpillars. We will place those on there for you, or we may give you a little enclosure to transfer it with the spoon and the brush. Once you get to that point, we're going to push that plant forward so that the leaves are touching the front and the sides. Now, why do you think that would be? Okay, remember this part about the various instars, how it's going to shed its skin? The caterpillar is going to walk off those leaves and go to some place generally other than the plant to shed its skin. And as a third, fourth, and fifth instar, it needs that bridge big time. One thing when it gets on that enclosure and it's kind of hanging out on the side, it will be motionless. Don't freak out, it's still alive. Don't touch it, don't poke it, don't spray it, leave it there. It's going to shed its skin, turn around like it did when it was a first instar, and it's going to eat that skin. There's a lot of nutrients in that skin that it needs as it grows. And then it will come down and again, use those leaves to, call, to walk across that little bridge back onto the plant. When it reaches the fifth instar state, it's going to use that bridge, use that leaf to crawl across up to the top of the enclosure, or it may do it on a, one of the upper leaves. It'll form that chrysalis and it will go through the transformation to the fifth instar. It'll be closed and you'll have your butterfly. Now again, placement 
of your enclosure is critical, you want to make sure that you put that enclosure where you can get access to it, where it's going to get the appropriate amount of light. It's going to experience the wind, the heat, the humidity. It's going to experience the rains that you have. If, for instance, you get a hard driving rain and a really bad wind, it is okay to bring it inside your house. And then when it turns nice again, maybe the next day, get it right back outside. You want accessibility to that plant, so make sure that if you need to water it, it's positioned at a certain way where you get that access. Now, one thing about this plant is that, like I said before, when you've watered it initially, you put a little bit of water into that saucer, that's going to be enough water for those 10 to 14 days to keep that plant growing as the monarch feeds on those leaves. So you should be good. You should not have to open up that enclosure. Better yet, you don't have to worry then so much about the predators or the pests getting in. You can set that enclosure up, zip it up, and just observe and have fun with that. Share that with your neighbors. Again, the book by Carol Pasternak is a great source to educate yourself because guess what? By having this enclosure, you will now be the expert in your neighborhood. You will be the one that knows everything. So again, I believe you're ready to bring this enclosure home. The big thing about this is we have limited quantities, so you're going to want to order this right away. As soon as this webinar is done, get on the computer and get it ordered. You're going to go to monarchresearch.org to Monarchs to order this. Once that is put through, myself or Cam or someone is going to pick that up. We are either going to give you a call or we're going to email you back to set up a time that you can come out to our research lab to pick up the enclosure. And we are also going to spend some time to talk to you about what we just shared today. And if you have any questions, we can address it there. Plus, we're going to kind of take some time to show off what we do out there at the research station. We'll hook you up with the plant, with the caterpillars, and make sure you're comfortable before you leave. You can pay for this with either cash or check. It all works for us. Again, understand with this, you now become a monarch zone. It's official. You have full access to what we have to offer. Your kit is going to provide years of fun, excitement, and you're going to want to share that with your friends and your neighbors. Your kids will become experts. But one other thing I failed to mention, for those people that do homeschooling, here's your biology project. People, right here is a great educational tool, not just for homeschooling, but for everyone of all ages. Remember that. So again, we will continue to support you. What I'm going to do now is turn this over to Cindy, and she's going to address any questions that we have. So Mike, some of the other questions that we've received via our website is, if I'm raising a, the monarchs in my enclosure and my children see a monarch butterfly outside, is it okay if I um, capture it and bring it into the enclosure? Uh, we appreciate the fact that they're getting excited when they see monarchs outside. But one of the concerns with that is the transfer of diseases. There is a problem out there called OE, and it's not really as prevalent here in Iowa, but it is out there. So we want to make sure that your enclosure, your life cycle enclosure is protected and safe. Those caterpillars and that, that butterfly you have in that enclosure, we want to keep safe. So if you bring in another butterfly and put it in there, there's a chance you can, you can cause more harm than good. Great. And then also a question that we have is, um, is it too late to start a kit or do we still have time? Oh, you have plenty of time. Right now is a great time. We, um, it's been kind of late this year as far as the, uh, the monarch season. It's just one of those things. We will have, soon we will have the milkweed available. The kits are here and we will be producing eggs to get those caterpillars developed to hand out. So it's not too early. You can actually continue with this program 
we will continue to hand out these kits all the way up through August 15th. That's going to be our cutoff. Now, the reason for that is that 30-day cycle, we want to really emphasize the point that we want to raise healthy monarchs and go through that life cycle of 30 days and allow them to get their bags packed and head down to Mexico to overwinter. So 30 days, August 15th to September 15th, they're on their way. Great. Also, uh, can we use the same enclosure from year to year? Yeah, yeah. We will have instructions out there on how to clean these, these enclosures. And we want people to really follow them line by line to understand this. By doing that, you will be able to utilize this kit year after year after year. Plus, I know people have asked, can we do a second generation on that milkweed? Well, what we want to do is take that pot with live milkweed, set it aside after your monarchs have been closed, take the enclosure itself and wash it, clean it, bleach it, sanitize it. And once it's dried, you can bring another pot that you can come out to our research facility, pick up with caterpillars for a nominal fee and put that into your enclosure and raise another generation as long as it's by August 15th. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in here, Mike, so we're gonna take a few more. Sure. Uh, can I leave for a few days without worrying about watering the milkweed? We've set this up, like I said, if you water that milkweed initially heavy and you have a little bit of water in that saucer down below, that once that plant begins to dry up, out a little bit, the water that's in the saucer is going to wick up and provide the moisture that that plant will leave. I would say a couple of days would be fine. It should be good for a week because you're looking at 10 to 14 days until it goes up to become a pup before it pupates and becomes a chrysalis. So you should be fine. You'll be fine. Great. And what about uh, being in Iowa where we can sometimes get uh, some crazy weather? Is there something I need to do if there's a heavy storm going on in my enclosures outside? Well, it will take the wind. It will handle the rain. But if you get some of these winds like we've had lately, you may want to be safe and just bring it inside. Once the wind or the rain comes down, then get it right back out there. But yeah, it's, it's again, it's your enclosure. It's your habitat. You want to take care of these caterpillars and these butterflies as they eat clothes. So no problem. Bring them inside. They'll be fine. Great. And then I just had to take one more and then we've got to get back on, I think. So uh, what do I do when after I've reared my monarchs and the season is over? What do I do with my milkweed and can I bring it in and use it again next year? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, restoring the habitat. And if you have the space outside, whether it be in your lawn or in your landscape, uh, maybe at one of your flower beds, if you want, you can take that pot out from the milky back and transplant it into that bed. One thing you can try, it does work. If you live in, like in an apartment complex or a, a condo, you can take and trim that back, keep it watered, maybe on your deck, and then in the winter or in the late fall, bring it inside where it's semi-cool. And then as it gets closer to the spring and it's not too bad outside, you can move it outside, you'll be fine and let it, uh, let it grow. It'll continue to grow, but just kind of get it protected. Great. And I know I said I wasn't gonna give you any more, Mike, but I, these are such great questions and you're doing a great job. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask just a few more. So we, we got a question that said, just to clarify, if we do a second generation, um, we can use the same milkweed, is that right? And then also after August 15th, can we plant the milkweed in our yard? Yeah, um, we really don't want to use that same milkweed to raise another generation because as those caterpillars are walking around for that first generation you have on that milkweed, there may be a chance that there may be some frass on that milkweed. They may have walked through it. The, if you do a, a generation, a second generation on that milkweed, 
the chance for passing on the disease or concern onto the next caterpillar could be there. And we don't want to have that. We want to raise healthy monarchs. For us, it's not about the quantity of monarchs you raise. It's about the overall health and vitality of the monarchs you release. We want to release healthy monarchs. So if you want to do, again, another generation, come out and see us. We'll provide you with another pot of healthy, actively growing milkweed. We can provide you with another set of caterpillars, and then you can raise another generation. Again, you can keep that milkweed. Take that milkweed and plant it in your yard. You'll be fine. In closing, uh, think about what we covered today. Think about uh, taking it, going to our website and find that video. When you find that video, it's going to take you to a whole new world. It's going to take you to an experience that is just amazing an experience that's going to last a lifetime. You're gonna see some things that you had no idea existed. When you see these monarchs in the overwintering habitat, it's gonna blow you away. So definitely go to our website and see that video by Brian Smith and Brian Keating by Great Big Nature. Also, think about the fun you're going to have raising monarch butterflies. I, like I said, you will become an expert and raising monarchs. And people are going to come to you to find out more. So share the excitement, share the, the, the fact that we are helping to make a difference, not just with the monarch, but other pollinators too. We have the opportunity here to make a difference. Again, remember, Cam Watts is going to be here on next Saturday, June 20th. He's going to share with you the advanced rearing of monarch butterflies in those bio tents. It's something you definitely don't want to miss. Again, as I shared to begin with, people, you need to order these kits now. Get online, get them ordered, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, because these are something you're going to want to experience. And finally, understand that there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that we can do to make a difference here. A lot of what we do impacts tomorrow. There's a lot of things happening here just in Iowa with raising monarch butterflies, but it's also happening throughout the United States. And as you've seen earlier, throughout the world. As we say, planting forward is our most significant gift to the next generation. Thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions, give me a call, send me an email. Take care, have a great day.